The Gift, Patrick F. McManus. Christmas isn't an easy time for me. Maybe it's because my father was a practical joker. When I was small, he would tell me that if I didn't behave myself, Santa would fill my stocking with kindling sticks and rotten potatoes. I would try to behave myself, but could never seem to get the hang of it. Christmas thus became a matter of great apprehension to me, because even though I couldn't behave, I wasn't stupid, and I figured Santa Claus had to have my name on some kindling and rotten potatoes. Sure enough, come Christmas morning, I would creep out of bed, peek around the corner at my stocking, and there would be some kindling sticks protruding from it, along with a few sprouts from rotten potatoes. Ugh! I would exclaim. Ho, 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 ho! My father would laugh. Then, of course, he would show me that under the kindling sticks and rotten potatoes were a ball, a top, and some dominoes, a tin soldier, and maybe some candy orange slices. I would punish him by playing all day with the kindling and potatoes. We didn't have psychology in those days, otherwise I might have been emotionally scarred for life by my father's little trick. As it is, I become uneasy at Christmas time. One of the reasons I become uneasy is the cost of things I put in my own kids' stockings. Digital watches, rock concert tickets, skiing lessons, and the like. Fortunately, the kindling sticks and rotten potatoes don't cost much and never fail to give me a good laugh. There's nothing funnier than teenagers dumping out their stockings and exclaiming, Aye! They exclaim that when they discover the stockings doesn't contain a set of new car keys. Probably the main reason for my unease, however, is the gifts I receive for Christmas. Whenever the kids ask my wife what to get old whoses for Christmas, she tells them, You know how he loves outdoor sports. Why don't you get him something outdoorsy? Good idea, they cry in unison. How much can he afford for us to get him? Let me state here that there should be a law prohibiting, prohibiting any person who uses the term outdoorsy from dispensing advice about what kinds of presents to buy an outdoorsman. A few years ago after my spouse advised oh few years ago after my spouse advised her I would like something outdoorsy, one of my wealthy aunts gave me something called the ultimate fishing machine. As near as I could make out from the operational manual, you stayed at home and watched TV while the UFM went out and caught the fish cleaned them, cooked them, and ate them. When it got back home, you asked the UFM what kind of luck it had, and it told you lies. The manufacturer claimed in his literature that the ultimate fishing machine had been made possible through the miracle of miniaturation. I would prefer a miracle that assembled the machine before passing it on to me. At the very least, the company could have miniaturized an engineer and enclosed him in the package to help put the UFM together. I never even attempted to assemble the ultimate fishing machine and so cannot report on its competence at fishing. Bothersome as it may be, I'd just as soon go to the trouble of catching, cleaning, cooking, and eating my own fish. If I work at it, I can probably learn to tell a few lies. Nothing gladdens the heart of a sporting goods store proprietor more than to be approached by a lady who says something like, My husband is the outdoorsy type. I wonder if you might suggest a suitable Christmas gift for him. The proprietor grins evilly and rumples his hair so as to conceal the horns protruding just above his temples. Here is his chance to revenge himself on one of the arrogant sportsmen who have snorted derivously, even guffawed openly at certain items of the proprietor's stock. Here's something fishermen are absolutely crazy about, he says. The musical fishing creel. Every time a fish is inserted, it plays Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. 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 If they go over their limit, Elvis Presley sings, I ain't nothing but a hound dog. Marvelous, the wife exclaims. I'll take it. Any other suggestions? Now here's a nifty item. A pair of sleeping bag warmers for backpackers. They look like bricks. That's what they are, but not just ordinary bricks, no ma'am. These are special high-density bricks. Just feel how heavy they are. 
The way they work, the backpacker heats them in the campfire and then inserts them in the sleeping bag. Keep him toasty warm all night. What a nice idea, the wife says. I'll take a set. How about a gag gift for the fellow who likes to go out exploring by himself in the wilds? A trick compass. See, every time you look at it, north shifts to a different direction. <laughs> it comes with maps that instantly dissolve when they come in contact with cold sweat. The compass and maps together are sold as $8.95 do-it-yourself do it yourself divorce kit. It's tempting, the wife says, but I better not. Here's a nice gift for the man who has nothing, the proprietor tells her. A tiny inflatable vest for grasshoppers. Keep them afloat. And with this little harness to fasten to them to the hook, they can be used over and over until fish takes them away or they die of old age. Oh, that is absolutely darling, the wife exclaims. I'll take two. Did I show you the grasshopper water skis? There are other reasons for my unease at Christmas. After my father died, Christmas was a rather bleak occasion at our house for a number of years. I got a foreshadowing of just how bleak our one Christmas was going to be when my mother warned me, if you don't behave, all Santa's going to put in your stocking is the kindling sticks. What about the rotten potatoes, I asked. He can't afford them this year, she said. Santa always seemed to come through with something, though, even if it were pre-owned, as they say. I would get some used clothes, used books, used toys, used candy. It was my sister the troll who gave me the used candy. This Snickers bar has teeth marks on it, I said. I know, the troll said. I forgot. I don't like caramel. You didn't lick it all over, did you? Examining the bar carefully for lick marks. No, she said. What kind of person do you think I am? Thinking that she was the kind of person who would lick a Christmas present, I worried for weeks after eating the candy bar that I would come down with some terrible disease carried by sisters. Even back when I was nine or ten, I was known as an outdoorsy type among the relatives. Rich Aunt Maud wrote my mother and asked what kind of outdoorsy present I would like for Christmas. My mother wrote back that I would just love something related to fishing. We speculated for weeks whether Maud would send me a fine fishing rod or a fine reel or tackle box filled with tackle. I thought possibly she might even come through with a boat, motor, and trailer. When the gift arrived, though, the boat, motor, and trailer were instantly ruled out because of the package's minuscule dimensions. So minuscule, in fact, that they also ruled out the fine fishing rod, reel, and tackle box. I figured all could be was a fly book filled up with expensive flies. Christmas morning, we all got up and rushed down to the Christmas bush, and the family waited with bated breath, mouthwash being unknown in those days. As I tore open the package from rich Aunt Maud, even to this day I can recall my response upon unveiling the presents. Aye. There lying in a state before me in monogram box with glittering foil wrapping and soft crinkly tissue paper were two silk neckties with pictures of fish on them. Don't be so upset, my mother pleaded, pulling me down off the wall. You can wear them with your new suit, whenever you get a new suit. And whenever you get a neck, the troll added. Now open my present. What is it? I said. The troll smiled sweetly. Gum. I must say it was pretty good gum, too. There was still a lot of flavor left in it. My mother always used to say that we should be grateful for whatever we received. Just think, she would admonish us. There are millions of people all over the country living in poverty who can't even afford popcorn to decorate their Christmas bush. I tried not to think of the poor people as I decorated the bush. How does this look? I asked as I stepped back to study my placement of the popcorn. Why not put it right up on the tip, the troll suggests. That way it'll look like a little tiny white star. The only person I knew at that time was Rancid Crabtree, the old woodsman who lived at the foot of the mountain about a mile from our place. I spent a large part of my early life following Rancid around and studying him and learning all sorts of interesting things. 
But Rancid was poor. He didn't seem to know that he was poor, however, and I never had the heart to tell him, because he was the happiest person I'd ever met. If he had known he was poor, of course, then he would have been sad and miserable all the time. As it was, Rancid was able to live out his whole life in blissful ignorance of the fact that he was poor. A few days before Christmas one year, I wandered over to Rancid's cabin to see what he was up to. He was carrying an armload of firewood into the cabin and invited me in. I looked around expecting to see a Christmas bush with some presents under it. There was nothing but the rumpled bed, the old barrel stove, a table and some broken chairs, rusty traps, a shotgun, some rifles on a wall pegs, and a few other odds and ends. Where's your Christmas bush? I asked him. If I was to have anything, it'd be a Christmas tree. But I don't see why I gots to bring a tree into the house with all you gots to look into the window and see all of them as I want. But what do you put all your presents under? I persisted. Rancid stared at me for a long moment, then snorted. I used to get all the presents. There'd be a pile of them so far to the ceiling, I'd kick them and stumbling over them all the time. So finally, I just up and tells folks, you shouldn't give me all them presents. You know I ain't missed one bit. A man just outgrows presents, I guess. I'd hope I'd never outgrow presents. And while I was thinking about that, a great wave of sorrow crashed down upon me and poured right down into the insides of my feet and filled up my toes and then came welling back up again in my throat. What's wrong with you, boy? Your stove is smoking, I choked. I better get some fresh air, and I bolted out the door. Rancid came out in the porch and watched me as I gasped cold air into my lungs. That's when the great idea occurred to me. Say, Rancid, I said, why don't you come have Christmas dinner with us at our house? Nah, couldn't do that. You know your old granny and me don't get along. Why, it was her who told me to invite you, I lied. She said to me, now you go give Rancid Crabtree an invite to Christmas dinner. Well, daggum mahad. Sure, you tell her I'll be happy as a hog at hanging to your shore your Christmas vittles with your alls. When I told Mom that I invited Rancid to Christmas dinner, she said she didn't know she could afford the extra expense. Heck, you won't eat much, I said. The expense I'm talking about is repairing the hole in the roof when your grandmother goes through it. Graham didn't go through the roof when she heard the news about Rancid. She took it rather well, as a matter of fact. As soon as she got done, hopping up and down in the middle of the kitchen and saying, Ay, 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 ay! Good gosh almighty boy, do you know what you've done? That rancid crab tree ain't took a bath since he fell in the creek in 27. Folks pay him just to walk by their farm so the smell will drive the ticks off their critters. And you invite him to Christmas dinner? Well, all we can do is put the extra leaves in the table and set you and him down at the far end. Hooray, I shouted. I'll even get things ready. How many extra leaves we got for the table? Graham shook her head. Not nearly enough, boy, not nearly enough. Personally, I didn't think that rancid smelled all that bad. But there was a story told that his approach from an upwind direction had once raised an alarm that the stockyards had caught on fire. In any case, there was a great deal of moaning and groaning among the women folk that rancid's presence at Christmas dinner would be a lingering one. The troll practiced eating with her nose pinched together, and Graham and Mom debated whether we should eat with all the windows open and hope a blizzard would come up and provide a strong cross draft. All of this carrying on began to worry me, because I didn't want to ruin Christmas dinner for the rest of the family. So the day before Christmas, I hastened through the snow to Rancid's cabin with the notion of persuading him that coming to dinner might not be such a good idea after all. Upon approaching the cabin, however, I noticed great white clouds rising from the doors and windows and cracks in the roof. I thought the place was on fire and ran yelling for Rancid to get out of the cabin. Rancid stuck his head out of a steam cloud. What in tarnation's all the ruckus about? I peeked past him into the cabin. There was a great tub on the pop. There was a great tub on top of the barrel stove, 
which was belching out smoke and flames on all sides, and the clouds of steam were boiling up from the tub. What you got in the tub, I asked. Rancid shuddered. Water! Ain't gonna do something ain't did since 27. It's a torture to me, but I'm gonna do it just for you, and hoping you appreciate it. Ain't don't never ask me to do it again, cause I ain't. Oh, I won't. I won't ask you to do it again, Rancid. I turned to sprint happily back to my house. See you at Christmas dinner tomorrow. When I burst into the kitchen, Graham was just removing from the oven a batch of cinnamon rolls. You don't have to worry about eating with the windows open at Christmas dinner tomorrow, I told her. Oh, Ranson ain't coming? He's coming all right, but this very moment he's, he's fixing us up a nice surprise. A gift, land sakes alive. We didn't think to get that dirty old rascal anything. Well, it's not exactly. Graham slapped a hot cinnamon roll out of my hand. Don't tell me exactly. I'll just wrap up these cinnamon rolls for him. Ain't nobody gives us a present. We don't give him a present back. But, no buts. Christmas Day, as we waited for Rancid to show up for dinner, Mom said, I'd feel better about this if we already had all the windows open when he came. That way we shouldn't be so likely to hurt his feelings. That's the way I feel about it too, Graham said. And we should put and we should have put the extra leaves in the table. Suddenly the troll, who had been looking out the window, shouted, Here he comes, and wow, you're not gonna believe this. There was a knock on the door, and Mom called out, Come right in, Rancid. In burst Rancid with a big snaggle tooth grin. Surprise! He shouted, and were we surprised? Why, you could have knocked every last one of us over with a feather. As soon as Mom had recovered from her astonishment enough to speak, she said, Rancid, why don't you throw open a few of those windows over there and let in some fresh air while we put the extra leaves in the tables? Then I want to get a better look at those keys. Steam the curve in the tips myself, Rancid said proudly. Put a couple birch boards in a tub of water on top of my stove, and them old tips bent just over as pretty as you please ain't made a pair of skids since twenty seven. I might want I might want whiter on that window if you please, Rancid Graham said. My don't that blizzard feel good. Now let me feast my eyes on them skis. They're for the boy, but I made em big enough cause so you can all use them if you want. That was one of the finest Christmas gifts and one of the finest Christmas dinners I'd ever known. As Mom said as we sat shivering happily around the table, it's a chill wind that blows no warmth.